What are you? No, really. What are you? Philosophers have been asking this question for about as long as humans have been around. We don't appear to think like other animals. We have a concept that at some point we will expire. We create technology and change our environments to an extreme level and have almost an innate desire to leave the planet that we currently reside on and then spread out to other places that as far as we know, aren't really even habitable for us. While other animals on this planet can show curiosity in more general ways, humans have hyper-focused ideas set on spreading out far beyond where we are now. Is it a desire to explore the unknown or is is it based on just pure survival, which would make us no different from the other fauna on this planet? Maybe this understanding is what drives all life. If it is out there to spread past their home base as well, this would be common. But with that said, in the events of dead space, humanity spreading out would find nothing but emptiness. Landing on planet after planet, the notion of the stars are ours would begin to crop up as no life anywhere was detected. Like being the last one awake at a friend's house when you were a kid, an overwhelming sense of silence was all our species would find as we continued to spread across the galaxy completely unopposed. This idea is known as the Fermi Paradox, which I have done a video on, which actually launched this whole channel. Essentially, the Fermi Paradox states that there are a couple reasons why we haven't detected life yet. Either we are the first to pass the Great Barrier, maybe that's the complex formation of multicellular life, or the Great Barrier lies before us and all other species that have branched out have already hit it and went extinct. Personally, I think the Great Barrier is our species unlocking the power of the universe, and in this case, the nukes. And then with our dumb ape brains, we nuke ourselves into oblivion but it remains to be seen on that. Anyhow, eventually, the Great Barrier would show itself to humanity, but even when we had time to pivot out of the way, humanity didn't really know what it was supposed to do. What would start out as an isolated event on a mining planet where nobody was supposed to be, as something was hidden there long ago, humanity would rediscover the marker. After finding the black marker on Earth almost 300 years previously, a micro-outbreak happened that resulted in Altman being taken out by a necromorph and an entire religion to be spawned as he was viewed as a martyr. At this point, the government would go on to continually study the marker, finally creating their own marker, which is known as the red marker, but it would become quickly apparent that the influences on the brain were absolutely detrimental. Reportedly with the black marker, two voices could be heard. One would tell you to attack and end the lives of those around you, and the other would whisper for you to stop the outbreak, but in reality, it would be pushing you towards a convergence event. During this time, an idea was brought up that maybe the hallucinations were a way of the brain protecting itself from the marker signal, which for all intents and purposes could be correct, but we will be going into that a little later on. As the government realized that the marker could not be controlled, they sought to hide it away on a planet well outside of where humans traveled. Then they would restrict the zone from any further exploration by quarantining it and then take out anyone who had knowledge or was associated with the marker project. This was temporarily successful. Humans completely forgot about the marker and as a result, the species would continue on spreading across the stars. But as we did this, we needed more energy, more materials, and more worlds to sustain ourselves and our growing population. Eventually, quarantining areas were tapped into by mining ships. Aegis 7 would prove to be the beginning of the humanity's downfall. Shortly after discovering the marker, a sickness began to spread across the small mining colony. Aggression was the first to arise between friends, family, and co-workers. People would begin hallucinating monsters everywhere, but really they were just other people before being brought down by others who weren't as influenced. Eventually, however, these monsters were no longer just hallucinations and a full-scale outbreak was happening. Small groups would attempt to escape the planet in chaos, but would still continue to become altered and changed even after getting away. On Aegis 7, a woman by the name of Lexine Weller would appear to show an absolute disregard for the marker and by association would almost present as something of a beacon of sanity for those around her as well. This apparent immunity to the effects of the marker would be spotted in others such as Ellie Langford. However, this trait was not very common. So the question is, why exactly are some immune to the marker signal whereas others fall quickly? And how can we figure out this by using Isaac's experience with the marker? Well, in today's episode, we will discuss just that. Now, I have done a video on Ellie's supposed immunity and briefly mentioned Lexine. That said, after thinking thinking about it some more and reading up on the history of Lexine and looking into some research articles on neurology, I think I have a better understanding of how this all might work now. So let's discuss in today's episode how immunity to the marker requires a massive amount of luck concerning your genes and also just the absolute state of your brain. So with that out of the way, first things first we need to establish is the black marker. 65 million years ago, the black marker crash landed on Earth as a part of an asteroid. This absolutely obliterated the dinosaurs or as we know in our universe, helped to obliterate the dinosaurs, but this was 
intentional. Considering the marker is extraterrestrial in origin, seeing as it's a farming technique from the Brethren Moons, this means that it was launched intentionally at Earth to help the animals there become more than what they were. See, dinosaurs had several hundred millions of years to become spacefaring, yet they never did. With the dinosaurs gone, the mammals were up to bat, except they had something else going on. As a signal permeated the planet, it was weak enough to not induce madness, but strong enough to influence the DNA. The best way that I could compare it is like a really weak thruster engine. Take something like the microwave thruster engine that produces the tiniest amount of thrust via microwaves. Over time, this thrust builds up, and it can get you to actually fractions of the speed of light, or it's hypothesized to. Which, if you really haven't heard about this engine, it's fairly interesting, though I imagine it's probably been disproven as it basically violates the laws of physics as we know it. Regardless, this is likened to the signal. The tiniest amount of energy was being output that would change DNA of mammals to help them become more intelligent and then spread out across the stars. Eventually, this resulted in Homo sapiens. Humans would become more and more intelligent at astronomical rates, almost seemingly out of nowhere. This intelligence would help us spread across the planet until finally, a small group would end up finding the marker. Referring to it as the devil's tail, the people were highly suspicious of it and would actually cross their fingers when talking about it. To them, it was an unholy relic that would induce hallucinations and accounts tell of it plaguing weak-minded villagers. But that's the interesting part right there. First, we have a group of villagers who presumably have lived around the marker for quite some time, possibly even hundreds of years. Second, they were able to do so because of their minds and those that were weak-willed or weak-minded would expire or be forced into exile by the village should they display symptoms. This would ultimately go on to create a group of people who were resistant to the marker over time. Those who had genes that were influenced by the marker likely would go insane well before they could reproduce, meaning that those that could resist likely would reproduce and then pass along those genes. And that's what we call natural selection. So we see that people in the village are different for several reasons, seeing as when others approach the marker, such as Altman, they are heavily influenced by it in the same way subsequent outbreaks would happen. The government, after creating its own, would have its people fall to the same effects. So this raises the idea. Possibly, this resistance can be obtained through time, but what it really comes down to is the passing of those genes to offspring. 300 years after the event that took place launching Unitology, humanity largely forgot about the markers, except for the occasional picture of the black marker or the preachings of the church, pretty much all in part due to the government cover-up. However, even with this idea out of the human mind, that doesn't mean genes forget. 300 years is a long time, though. Well, at least for humans, it's a long time. Cosmologically speaking, it's not even a noticeable blip. During this time, humans did what humans do, make more humans. Genes were spread, new mutations arose, and likely without the influence of the black marker, considering we had no idea where it went, humanity continued on almost unhindered or unchanged by the marker and continued to spread across the stars. Then, just like that, we were back in action, baby. Aegis 7 popped open a can of worms that really should have likely been kept closed. As mentioned, during the outbreak, one woman in particular, Lexine Murdoch, now known as Lexine Weller, seemed to be completely immune to the marker's signal. Watching those around her go absolutely insane, her small group would try to make it off the planet and back to the Ishimura to escape. It is shown that she never once hallucinates, and if group members that she's with get outside of a certain distance from her, they begin to exhibit aggressive behavior uncharacteristic of their usual thinking and being, and this may be indicating that they are also beginning to hallucinate. However, should she get back within range of them again, they will begin to calm and regain their sanity. So the question is, where does this come from? Now, we all know Dead Space and this channel. I believe everything has to do with how you think, what you can and can't resist, and your genes coming into play. So to recap, we know what's going on back at the village. The marker influences the mind, and if you were weak-minded or weak-willed, you would likely go insane. Over time, this left those with the strongest will and minds and cold any other mutations and genes that would have led to those with weak wills from entering the population. So first things first, Lexine's immunity is dependent upon her will. Willpower is kind of really a fickle thing. Willpower fades over time as exhaustion sets in. In Lexine's case, her willpower likely wavered quite a bit as those around her began to fall to the monsters that were attacking her group. Her willpower may have been actually rather low after boarding the Ishimura after crash landing on the hull and then finding that the ship was actually infected too. But we do know that willpower can really be kind of a generalized role concerning marker influence. It is known with Ellie Langford that she herself was a very strong-willed person, being the only surviving member of her crew on Titan Station. Isaac was also extremely strong-willed, which allowed him to resist the marker for quite some time as well. That said, there's also another aspect we need to discuss, which we all know is intelligence. And this is where we start to cross over into genetics mixed with neurology. It is stated several times in the game that those who are more intelligent will see coding and symbols to be worked out. Those who are not as intelligent will see things like monsters hallucinate and be completely driven mad by the images and sounds flashing in their head. But you have to ask yourself, 
yourself. What exactly is intelligence? Well, it's been thought for a long time that intellect isn't necessarily related to brain size. It's not actually all that incorrect either. In fact, it's not like Einstein had a massive brain compared to any of us. In fact, his brain was a little bit smaller than what was considered average. Whereas Neanderthal was by no means not intelligent, but Homo sapiens seem to have just a little bit of an edge on them despite our brains being smaller in size. With all that said, the brain itself may be smaller, but it may come down to neuron size and dendritic density as well as cortical density. According to the Human Brain Project, which I will link in the description, those who have larger neurons and more branching dendrites are able to process information quicker than those who have more standard features concerning their connections between neural tissue and the brain itself. While these larger neurons may not necessarily make the brain larger, considering they are found in the temporal lobes, they may make a person more intelligent and actually increase the activity of the brain overall. This activity is crucial as we will come to find out. With more intelligent people absorbing and understanding the world around them better, the signal could be likened to a voltage issue. In those with normal brains, the cells are overloaded by the energy received from the marker. The cells begin firing, which they shouldn't, which may in fact be that defense mechanism that they are talking about, and this will sort of stabilize the action potentials as the extra juice is coming in, and this will cause hallucinations. So think of it like trying to power an entire house through one extension cord. There's a lot of juice running through that small line. With a more intelligent person, possibly their dendrites can handle the extra inflow of energy. So they don't just see noise, they see the symbols to build the marker. But it isn't enough to just be smart, as they are still being influenced by the marker, they just start ending themselves almost immediately, and look no further than Isaac Clark for this. But we see this is a possibility with Lexine, as after her brain scans, they are apparently off the charts. This could indicate that her brain is sharing the load of incoming energy more effectively than those who have already turned or are suffering. With that said, there's an entire aspect to all of this that's affecting the body as well. We know the body is influenced as well as the mind. After your brain gives up and you expire, you will be turned and formed into a monster to continue on the convergence event. That would imply that your body is being altered post-mortem, but pre-mortem, why isn't this happening? Why does it require the expiration of the mind to have the body to change? Well, I believe it goes back to cell expiration and then reanimation. Our brains exercise a lot of control over our bodies and our bodies exercise a lot of control over our brains. We like to think that we are in the driver's seat, but studies are beginning to emerge that show if your gut microbiome is off, it can cause depression in people. So are your guts in charge? Well, not really, but it turns out we are intrinsically attached to our bodies in more ways than just life support. Who would have thought our bodies were so important? Well, considering they keep us alive, I would hope all of us. But then we have to ask, if our body's life depends on our brains and vice versa, why is it that some people drop at 50 while others live to be like 110 years old? Does diet, exercise, or luck really have everything to do with it? Well, there's actually a multitude of things that go along with this, but the crux of the issue all goes back to our DNA. If you undergo cellular mitosis, grow, and age, something terrible begins to happen. Our DNA becomes damaged over time. Through choices we make every day, like drinking, smoking, eating fatty foods, sitting around, this can impact the health of our DNA and then cause mutations. But it really doesn't matter how healthy you are because currently, with each cellular division, accidents happen, mistakes are made, and DNA is cut off and never reclaimed. This all leads to cellular degradation over time. And because of this, this can result in cancers, but always with enough time, it'll result in cells not functioning properly. When this happens, you begin to age, things break down, and eventually your body stops working. It's really just all a time game. So ask yourself again, why do some people live for 100 years, whereas some forms of cancers at 30 cause people to drop? Again, outside influences do matter, but so does correction of DNA. Inside of your body are proteins known for their ability to repair DNA. In particular, DNA ligase is one. They will find mismatched pairs, changes in templates, mutations that could arise, and then they will repair that damaged area. Our lives are much longer as a result of these enzymes, but they are not perfect. Even if they catch 99.9% .9 of issues, over time, that 0.1% builds up and creates larger cascading problems. With this in mind, we know that the marker has an effect on the genetic coding of people by changing and altering the bodies and inspiring new growths. Not to mention the black marker, which has guided our entire species into changing concerning our DNA. So when the marker is removed after the Ishimura is reclaimed, it's noted that everyone falls into a genetic sludge, meaning that the DNA is still present somewhat, but has been changed over time by the presence of the marker. While the body is under the influence of the brain, likely changes in the DNA are happening with the marker, but it is very slight. It's only after the expiration that the marker's effect can really change the body, and it's because it's reanimating cells. While you are alive, these changes in DNA are slight, but they can change the genetic coding in the brains of people, as well as leading to changes in how the neurons express the proteins that it is able to make, which in turn 
earn and change how the brain functions, leading to the likely end of a person. However, what I would propose is not only does Lexine have the increased willpower and likely intelligence, but also has a specific DNA correcting function. This would bolster her cells at a genetic level, allowing for her to resist the impact of the marker. We again see that with the village people, they likely had this as well as they never devolve into monsters and anyone who may have lacked this ability to correct their DNA at an increased capacity would fall. This wouldn't be too strange now actually as how many people do you know that are over 100 years old? Likely none. If you do know somebody, it's probably like one person. It's because it's a very unusual trait to have. Most people just have these standard repair functions. However, with this village, it's a necessary trait to have because you have survived there for so long. Whereas all the normies with their standard genetic repair mechanisms would fall. The thing about DNA ligase and its mega repair function is that it can crop up anywhere at any time in any one. Well, at birth anyways, it doesn't just happen halfway through your life. So it's entirely possible people completely unrelated to one another would develop this gene sequence through DNA exchange at fertilization and have this specific function. So while it can likely be passed down to subsequent offspring, it can still form in others, which is why the resistance to the marker may be so rare because not only is it depending on you having larger neurons and more branching dendrites for processing power, but you also need an advanced form of DNA repair enzymes. And even with all of this, you still have to get lucky enough to actually survive the onslaught of necromorphs attacking you. As made mentioned in my Ellie Langford episode, I believe that she also too has a decreased capacity, but is still kind of the same as Lexine. Ellie has an increased ability to resist the marker as she never goes insane from being in the presence of it. While she is not able to save Strauss from going off the deep end, we do see that possibly she is able to keep people who haven't been affected as deeply yet focused. When her group went to Tal Volantis, they were around a planet literally covered in markers, yet no one fell to the influence of the marker and instead were either taken out by monsters or taken out by the elements. We see this is actually different from when Carver and Isaac are together. Ellie's group remains sane, whereas Carver arrives and is around Isaac and he gets no protection and then must attack the infected neuron in his brain like Isaac did. As far as we know, nobody else had to do that. So the question is, what is this field of influence exactly? This field is nothing but reliant on the person's brain as a conduit. We're about to get into energy as an actual force here for a moment, and the best way I can explain my thinking on this is if you take like a prism and you put it in light, it separates the light into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, right? That light itself is an energy, but it's also a particle, but it is split up by physical matter into its corresponding light points. I believe the same thing is happening around Lexine and Ellie. When the signal enters their brain due to increased brain activity and the ability to handle the incoming signal, as well as the body remaining in a actual functional state due to genetic repairs, the signal is split up into its corresponding parts. Some parts may likely even be distorted, such as the insanity portion, which causes it to not be as effective in her own mind, or even effective at all. Then possibly the secondary voice that's heard, which is basically stop the necromorph outbreak or escape it, is believed to be your own thought, just like when Isaac tries to stop it from happening, but he gets tricked. However, for others, this would seem like an innate thought of their own, and likely it doesn't cause them to have any issues in their mind as it's viewed as coming from them. We know with the marker signal that there is no way to stop it as well. Nothing in its way will stop it as likely it's a form of signal we don't really understand. Now, measuring the electrical fields in the brain is difficult because our skull acts as a sort of Faraday cage. But this signal distortion after coming into contact with the brain of Lexine or Ellie is not bound by normal electrical fields of the brain. And because of this, it exits the brain and creates a field around the person. This signal, considering it's similar to the signal that's coming off the marker, may create an interference at a certain range. Sort of like two radio stations competing for the same frequency. Because of this, it cancels out the marker signal in a limited range as its power quickly dwindles, as after being split up and hitting the matter that altered it, it took considerable energy away from it. This may explain why larger neurons and more dense connections are needed to ferry away the incoming energy. To survive the marker signal, it would appear that you need quite a few things to keep you going. Genetic repair would be the first big hurdle, and most of humanity doesn't really have that. Next, larger neurons and dense cortical tissue, as well as more dendritic connections, would be necessary to process this incoming information to stop you from going completely insane. And lastly, willpower ties everything together, but it's fleeting based on circumstances. Willpower would keep you focused on what you're trying to do, but even the strongest willed people alone cannot outlast the marker signal forever, so much more is needed to be truly immune to the signal.